I've been trying to think of a way to talk about Icewind Dale again since I released my first video about it back in March. I've had absolutely zero success in that regard, which means it's time to do the next best thing, damn it. Which is, as if the title of this video didn't spoil it, to talk about the second game. Released in August of 2002, just over two months after Neverwinter Nights, which is an aspect that I'll touch on later, Icewind Dale 2 sees the player return to the frigid north of the Ten Towns to once again delve through a trove of dungeons filled with the customary assortment of enemies, granting bounties of loot and experience, with a story that, just like the first game, does everything in its power to make sure it doesn't get in the way. How Icewind Dale 2 came to be is something of a tale of desperation. See, Black Isle Studios, the division of Interplay that published the Baldur's Gate series while developing Icewind Dale and Planescape themselves, was actually working on another title by the name of Torn. Torn was, as best can be gleaned, supposed to be a fantasy take on the systems of the first two Fallout games. However, Torn was eventually cancelled due to the fact that its projections were insufficient and, more importantly, that Interplay was going bankrupt. As such, they rapidly shifted towards their old workhorse, the Infinity Engine, in an attempt to stay afloat. And I do mean rapidly. Icewind Dale 2 was effectively developed and released in the span of about a year, despite the fact that it brought numerous changes from the games that preceded it. The most prevalent of those changes being the fact that the game is played in Dungeons & Dragons 3rd Edition ruleset, being the only Infinity Engine title, including the later release of Siege of Dragonspear, to present anything other than 2nd Edition Advanced Dungeons & Dragons. The game was a success, with it earning many of the same critiques as its predecessor. Unfortunately, the game was not nearly enough of a hit to stem Interplay's bleeding, and Black Isle was effectively dissolved the following winter of 2003. The similarities between the first and second Icewind Dale titles really are striking. Beyond the intentional that both are combat-based dungeon-crawling affairs with thin stories, the duo are even similar in how their legacies were almost defined by the games released around them. Remember in my first video when I talked about how the first game got overshadowed by Baldur's Gate 2? Well, the second game suffered the same fate in the way that it followed the release of Neverwinter Nights. Neverwinter Nights had a brand new engine, a toolkit for fans to create their own adventures within, and widely expanded online features. Icewind Dale 2, trapped within what was, at that point, the skeletal framework of the Infinity Engine, regardless of the improvements it brought, looked like a dinosaur in comparison. And the media took notice. It's pretty much impossible to find a review of Icewind Dale 2 from around the time it was released that doesn't compare it, usually unfavorably, to Neverwinter Nights. But here's the thing. Much like the first game, regardless of the opinion garnered in relation to its contemporaries, Icewind Dale 2 is really good on its own. And in a lot of ways, it might be better than the first game. And I'll be brutally honest, that was something of a revelation that hit me as I played through it again for this video. I have not played Icewind Dale 2 nearly as much as I have some of the other Infinity Engine games, so there was a great deal that surprised me as I revisited it. For one, if you'll remember, I said this in my video of the first game about the combat that is the focus of both of these titles. As far as I'm concerned, Icewind Dale is as good as combat ever got in an Infinity Engine game, and still holds up against modern takes on the genre. Yeah, I might have to recant that statement. Granted, I think we're talking about 1A and 1B here, but it's a change of opinion nonetheless. Let me take a minute here to pause and make clear that if you want a deeper dive into the very framework of these two games, especially in the contrast between combat and story, you should check out the first episode I've referenced numerous times already. Not trying to waste anyone's time or hawk my old videos, but the content of this episode is decidedly more based around looking at the advancements present in the second game, but due to the similarities between both games, a lot of the same points brought up in that video apply here. Okay, back to the good stuff. I say this as someone that is not a huge fan of 3rd edition, or 3.5 for that matter, it is shocking how well it works inside the Infinity Engine. You get all the same razor-sharp aspects of what makes combat in the Infinity Engine great, such as the ability to control the speed and flow of combat, along with the numerous different ways you can construct and outfit your party. But ironically, I think the reason that the combat in the second game eclipses its predecessor has very little to do with the actual combat itself. I mean, despite the change of rule set, this is the same Infinity Engine combat that everyone has come to know and love. Where you're clicking, how you're positioning your party, and which enemies you're trying to dispatch first are all likely very similar at this point. It's still incredibly fun, of course, 
but it isn't fundamentally different from anything already seen from these games as far as how it's physically carried out. Rather, where Icewind Dale 2 sets itself apart is in the way that it unleashes a whole new slew of possibilities onto the player. This is mostly done through the presence of the feature system that was introduced in 3rd edition, which allows the player to more specifically train their characters in skills as they see fit. Whether it be bolstering their skills to engage in combat, strengthening the innate abilities granted by classes, or even a few decidedly role-playing oriented dalliances, feats allow characters to have much more of an identity to them. And for as broad as a number of the feats may seem, they really have a sizable impact on the way that characters play. A fighter that's skilled in weapon finesse, which allows them to use their dexterity for attack and damage rolls, is going to use different weapons, armor, and tactics than a tank dumping points into toughness and specific weapon proficiencies. Most spellcasters are going to want the combat casting skill, which allows them to better maintain concentration while being attacked, but what happens after that? Do they skill in feats that allow their spells to hit more often and, in the aggregate, deal more damage? Or do they skill in feats that are more utility-based, such as subvocal casting, which basically makes it so that they can never be silenced? The ability to take different classes in so many different directions means that there is a lot more at the player's disposal. It's a lot deeper. Classes can often be teched in ways that allow them to fill roles that weren't previously possible. The best example of this is likely the Bard class, and I use them as an example because regardless of the addition, they're probably the most wide open class to begin with. And by that, I mean they're a complete f***ing mess. They get weapon skills, healing spells as an arcane spellcaster, some musical numbers, the ability to wear armor but not cast with it on, and a whole bunch of skill specializations. They are so average at everything that they basically can't be good at anything. Okay. I'm not a huge fan of bards, okay? But through the use of feats, you can train them more specifically in one of those many areas, making it very possible to find a meaningful role for them in your party in relation to the other characters. You can ignore their casting abilities in place of better armor and weapon usage, or make their spells more potent. Not to mention they, like a lot of other classes, have a few class-specific options they can take, such as buffing their songs. Or, you can be like me and make your bard completely useless by skilling them in a bunch of feats like Mercantile background. She basically just walked around playing her song and occasionally casting the spells I didn't think were important enough for my sorcerer to learn. I might as well have played with five characters. And for as much as these different possibilities might seem like a lot to wrap your head around, it all comes together very easily, mainly because there is no learning curve to this game. Like I said before, because of the fact that this all takes place in very familiar confines, you can almost solely focus on how these features affect your characters and the gameplay. It's not like the case of Neverwinter Nights where you have to balance the new presentation along with the changes to the rule set. Gushing about the way these doors have been opened is a distinctly odd feeling for me. Believe it or not, I believe that restriction in game rules is a good thing, particularly in the way that it aids in maintaining balance. I earnestly believe that the way in which the 4th and 5th editions of Dungeons & Dragons are purposefully written so that anyone can pretty much do anything they want is the inherent reason as to why both of those rule sets are so broken in a lot of ways. And my goodness, I'm going to stop myself there before I open a can of worms that is probably best saved for another video. The reason these new possibilities play so well in Icewind Dale 2 is because the balance that is threatened to be upended by them is maintained by the fact that there are still quite a few restrictions in place. Certain classes are still alignment and race locked, while vocations such as Paladin outright cannot be dueled without losing the ability to level in them again later. Many of the features themselves require a fair number of prerequisites in order to be taken, and arcane spellcasters incur massive penalties to their abilities if they wear proper armor. As unfun as these restrictions may sound to some people, they're a huge part in what keeps the game fun, mainly due to the way that they stop any one class from really outpacing any of the others to any severe degree. And believe it or not, restrictions as a whole were an unexpected boon for Icewind Dale 2. The age and limitations of the Infinity Engine were not exactly accommodating, which meant that there was a whole lot that couldn't actually be adapted, which in turn led to the removal of certain aspects of the 3rd edition rule set. Absent are mechanics such as attacks of opportunity, as well as a number of class-specific skills. This led to the game being much more streamlined as a whole, which serves to better accentuate its best parts. Not to mention, these restrictions paved the way for new inclusions, best seen in the number of sub-races complete with their own racial skills and ability bonuses found in character creation. 
This is easily one of my favorite parts of the game. They add a lot of flavor to your characters and fit remarkably well within the context. I can appreciate as well that they didn't skimp on the bonuses for a lot of these races, best seen in the Drow and Deep Gnomes. These massive bonuses are offset by the fact that these races level much more slowly than generic ones. While the improvements to combat are really where the second game shines, it's also markedly better in terms of story. Don't get me wrong, the story in this game still isn't great. It's pretty shallow overall and in dire need of more impactful villains outside of the main antagonists. In comparison to the first game, however, it doesn't randomly abandon plot points on a whim and is much more cleverly written, with a good amount of foreshadowing if the player knows who to talk to and where to look. It ties in nicely to the events of the first game, with the exploits of your old party brought up a few times, and while I don't really consider this a spoiler, the way in which it takes you back to some of those classic areas is pretty neat. It's a shameless way to reuse assets, but it's a nostalgic one for sure. Ainon Zur, and I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, I'm sorry though, replaced Jeremy Soul as the composer. Zur has composed for a number of well-known series, namely Dragon Age, Bethesda's Fallout games, and plenty more. While I don't think the score in the second game is as great as the first, there is a noticeable lack of any single really iconic track in its mists, it still does more than a serviceable job providing the ambiance of most every situation. This is best shown in some of the softer tracks of the various towns. The howling chill of the north comes across in nearly every note. Something that I wanted to talk about in my first video, but frankly forgot about, was my appreciation of the artwork. I have no idea what sort of style this is considered, but the way in which the portraits and artwork are stylized as proper paintings does a lot in terms of drumming up the atmosphere. They're much more expressive than the modernized, pseudo-realistic offerings of the Baldur's Gate titles. They just feel like they fit the setting better overall. If I had one real criticism, it's the fact that this game is really difficult. I've never bought into the assertions that the Icewind Dale games are all that much tougher than Baldur's Gate and Planescape, but playing through this game again made me realize that I probably should've. The game often puts you against massive quantities of enemies at once, of which the complete gamut of the monster manual makes an appearance. You start by fighting hordes of orcs and goblins, working your way up the food chain to demons, and of course, dragons before the end. Enemies are much smarter in general, frequently attacking in packs and utilizing a collection of spells that will make your life hell. The game scales at a much faster rate as well. You'll reach level 5 or 6 before you're even done with the first chapter. And trust me, you'll need every piece of that experience to stand up against these encounters. Granted, I don't think it's unfairly difficult or anything like that, and Josh Sawyer, one of the game's lead designers, specifically stated that they designed the game and heightened difficulty with Infinity Engine veterans in mind. That fact is pretty evident. It's a nice challenge for someone like me, but if you're new to the Infinity Engine series, this definitely shouldn't be where you start, because you will suffer. Regardless of that, however, I was impressed by how Icewind Dale 2 exceeded my expectations on this playthrough. In a lot of ways, it takes all the best parts of the first game and gives you a whole lot more that you can actually do, while maintaining its balance well enough to still remain fun. Not to mention that it does clean up some of the non-combat areas, even if not by much. What spurred me to make a video about this game to begin with is the fact that it has been excluded from the renaissance that its siblings have experienced in the mid-2010s. If you weren't aware, there is no enhanced edition, those being the updated versions of the Infinity Engine games, for Icewind Dale 2. The reason for this is incredibly simple. No one knows where the source code is. Beamdog, the studio behind the Enhanced Edition line, basically put out an open letter to anyone that might have a copy of it so that they could work on it. Now, I've got a whole lot that I would like to say about this, but I'm going to do my best to stay calm, brief, and respectful to the whole situation. What? The fact that no one, not Interplay themselves, nor anyone individually that worked on the game has a copy of the source code is absolutely ludicrous to me. I understand that the value of source code is a matter of debate, but whether you think it's worth a fortune or a single penny, source code is effectively digitized money. It is what every developer wants when they set out to work on something. You do not throw out source code. I don't care what it's for. And if it's missing because it wasn't backed up and maintained properly, then shame on whoever was in charge of making sure it was. And the fact that Icewind Dale 2s can't be found is something of a problem, because the original versions of these Infinity Engine games do not run well at all on newer systems. The reason for that is, well, not complicated, but it is incredibly boring, so I'll spare you the details. Likely the single best thing that the Infinity Engines do is that they optimize these titles. You install them, you hit play, and they work. 
Icewind Dale 2 is not optimized, and yes, it's a bit of a hassle to actually get it working. You have to install a number of different fixes, including patches, and jump through more than a few hoops to get it running. And even then, it might not function perfectly. I like to think that the issues I had stem from the fact that I'm playing from an old disc, but considering many of the solutions I found came from the forums of a certain goddamn website that I can't seem to go a single video without mentioning, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that it isn't much better digitally, either. Even if it claims to be. After a lot of trial and error, however, I do think I got my setup pretty close to flawless. There would be a minor glitch or stutter occasionally, but nothing that actually impacted gameplay. I will leave my settings in the description for anyone that may be curious. Beyond the technical reasonings, it's just nice to see official support and effort for the games we've come to love over the years. Regardless of what you might think of some of the content that Beamdog added to their re-releases, not to mention the state of their original effort, you have to appreciate what they've done to breathe new life into these games. I've got mixed opinions about some of the original content myself, but I still think unequivocally, that the enhanced editions are the best way to play these games at the moment. They've brought them to a host of new platforms and introduced them to an entire new generation of players. Also, as I'm sure you've noticed, it would have been nice to be able to scale this UI because, my god, it's tiny in widescreen resolutions. And when you've got a lot of looting to do, you really start to miss that quick bar that the enhanced editions added. As fun as Icewind Dale 2 might still be, it could use some of the quality of life changes that come with the enhanced editions. Icewind Dale 2, unfortunately, has found itself stuck in this strange sort of limbo. It's available, sure, but it's currently impossible to buy it in the same quality as literally every other Infinity Engine game. Considering everything I've said about it to this point, it definitely deserved better than to be left in the dust. Icewind Dale 2 deserves the same treatment that the other titles received. Luckily for us, not all hope has been lost on that front. A couple of years ago, a collection of modders known as the Red Chimera Group announced that they were taking it upon themselves to create their own version of Icewind Dale 2 Enhanced Edition. Featured in this reimagining is a host of new items, spells, and even changes to specific areas, streamlining puzzles and alleviating some of the more untoward aspects of the game's design. There are new dialogue options for certain NPCs, allowing for new, often dialogue-based ways of progressing through the story, as well as making certain characters recruitable, transforming the game into a sort of pseudo-Baldur's Gate. For those that are into masochism, it reworks much of the Heart of Winter difficulty and has numerous options for adjusting the difficulty of general combat encounters. Outside of that, it brings changes to many of the game's systems, rebalancing classes and fine-tuning the capabilities of enemies, while upping the level cap and changing level scaling. Many of the changes made by the Red Chimera Enhanced Edition feel very natural, which is probably the best thing I can say about them. The new spells and items fit in well, the class reworks don't completely upend the balance of the rule set, and many of the aspects help to make up for some of the original game's oversights, namely in the way that it makes items like spell scrolls more prevalent and cleans up the UI in places. This new frame in the chapter screen looks great, I love it. Most importantly, outside of the recruitable NPCs, which are in dire need of some characterization, there is a level of professionalism present. Someone that didn't know that most of the aforementioned changes came from a mod would likely be none the wiser. I should probably elaborate on that. The Red Chimera Enhanced Edition is technically a mod, but that's actually a good thing. Because of the fact that this is a mod installed through the wonderful command prompts that make up fan-made Infinity Engine efforts, you can pick and choose which aspects from that much abbreviated list that I just rattled off to include in your game. It's not all or nothing as it is with the proper Beamdog Enhanced Editions. For the playthrough done for this video, I installed many of the new dialogue options, as well as most of the options that made combat more difficult, while staying away from anything that made any significant changes to the rule set or classes. That was what worked for me, and I can honestly say that I much preferred having the ability to choose what I wanted to see in my playthrough. Being able to remove something that you don't like is awesome, and I wish game developers were more willing to let players make their own choices about what they want out of their games. What I think sets the Red Chimera Enhanced Edition apart from the other mods that I've talked about for other Dungeons & Dragons titles, namely the Circle of Eight for Temple of Unmental Evil, is that ultimately, it isn't necessary. It's an insanely enjoyable way of spicing up what might be familiar content for some, make no mistake, but Icewind Dale 2 was not fundamentally broken in any way that necessitates its usage. The original, unmodded release plays just fine from a gameplay standpoint. 
although I should mention that the Enhanced Edition does make the game run a bit better in certain ways, so that might be something to make note of. Whether you're playing said original game or diving into what is currently the best example we've got of an Enhanced Edition, Icewind Dale 2 is well worth your time. It's going to be a complete bitch to set up on newer systems, but the depth and possibilities found in its combat more than makes it worth the effort, which makes the fact that it's been left to die all the more unfortunate. 